Yeah, so let's welcome MK Asante. What's up, y'all? How you doing? I feel a lot of love in this room. Am I right? I feel a lot of good energy in here. I'm, I'm, feeling, uh, I'm feeling this place. Um, okay, I see what you're doing here, Dr. Kasi. Where are you at? Thank, uh, before I start, I want to give a round of applause to Dr. Kasi. You know, she made this happen, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, shout out to her, um, and shout out to the distinguished faculty, and um, shout out to all of the students who presented on Buck. Give yourself a round of applause. Um, I guess I should know what you presented before I start clapping. <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm MK Asante, obviously uh, the author of Buck. I'm here to talk today about so many things. Um, get your questions, comments, just have a dialogue, you know what I'm saying, um, about Buck. I'll talk a little bit about what it is to me and just kind of where I wanted to go with it and then we can kind of open it up to a larger, larger form. But um, Buck for me is like everything. Um, I remember when I got the idea to call it Buck. Uh, I, you know, when you get an idea, a lot of times ideas start, I always love bad ideas because bad ideas always lead me to good ideas. So I always start, like when I get an idea, I have a bunch of bad ideas first and then finally I'll get a good idea. I remember when I got Buck, I called my mom and I was like, Buck. And she was like, that's it. She knew that that was the title of my memoir, right? Because it represented so many things. Young Buck, Buck Wild, Buck Shots, Buck Town, Slave Buck, Black Buck, Make Buck, Buck Now. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, you know, all of those different elements, you know? Oh, y'all like that? <laughs> um, all of those different elements, though, you know, um, represent Buck to me. Like, you know, you have Young Buck, right? And that's just me growing up in Philly, wilding out, Buck Wild, right? That's uncontrollable. Buck Shots, that's the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, body more murderland. That's the senseless violence that we're going through in these, in these places, right? Buck Town, that's hip hop, right? Slave Buck, Black Buck, that's the racism of the past and the racism that still exists today, right? Make Buck, that's entrepreneurship, that's classism, right? Buck Now. I'll come back to that one. That's, that's, that's the most important one right there, you know? Um, then there's Buck Naked. And that's a real important one. You know why? She's like, what? what? She's like, Buck Naked? You know why Buck Naked is important? Because this is a memoir. And when you write a memoir, I, I don't think there's any better analogy I can use than being butt ass naked. That's what happens when you write a memoir. You just take off your clothes and the world can see everything. That's what writing a memoir. So, Bucky naked. You know what I'm saying? That's what, you know. And, 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 and I think a, a lot of times we think vulnerability is, is weakness. You know, you get scared to be vulnerable. But I think what this memoir and writing taught me was that vulnerability is the strength. You know, it, 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 it's the, uh, it gives you an unfuckwittableness, you know? Um, and I talk about that in the book. I talk about being unfuckwittable, right? And how being with my brother made me feel, in fact, how many people read the book in here? Okay, so basically everybody, so. <laughs> that's what's up. So I'm not gonna really read, read that much from the book then because you guys are familiar with it, but when I talk about that, being with my brother, feeling unfuckwittable, you know, um, to me, that's what the, the kind of being vulnerable and putting things out there, that's what it does for you. It gives you kind of a sense of nobody can do anything to you, right? Like, you're, you're, you've put it out there, you know, um, you're one with yourself um, and you understand yourself. And so telling Buck helped me, un like writing Buck helped me actually understand who I was, my own story, you know what I mean? Um, in so many different ways. I wanted to introduce people to my family, but I also wanted to introduce people to the city where I'm from. How many people from Philly in here? Philly. Okay, Philly, Philly. Like, so for example, so when you write a memoir, you're introducing people to the entire world of your life. So my life, 
growing up in Philly, uptown Philly, North Philly, Germantown, um, I wanted to introduce people to it. So I'm, a, I'm gonna read one part of the book and then kind of talk a little bit about this. Um, so in the opening of the book, my brother's rolling a blunt and I say, he folds, rolls, and tucks. Another perfect blunt. John looks like a paintbrush. All oh, my Philly people, you know, you know where I'm going with this. So now, when I wrote this, my, my editor at Random House was like, he was like, MK, you're gonna have to explain this word, John. You know, you used it all throughout the book, and what does it mean? So I decided, okay, I'm gonna take a, a moment out in the book and kind of explain what John means. So I say, um, John can mean anything, person, place, or thing. Sometimes if we're telling a story and we don't want people to know what we're talking about, we'll plug John in for everything. Yo, the other day I was at the John around the corner with the young John from down the street, right? Let me get to the John, right? And the boy at the door all on his John, not knowing I had that John on me, yo, what's about to be on in that John? <laughs> and like, so that's so dope to me because it's like all about coded language and it's all about context, right? Like if you don't know the context, you have no idea what we're talking about, right? I could be like, yo, what's up with the John now? Or like, yo, we still doing that John later? You have no, you, he, the dean doesn't know. If, if he doesn't have the context in, in, the, in the conversation, he has no idea what we're talking about, you know what I'm saying? And vice versa. Me and the dean could be like, yo, is we still going to go later? And you wouldn't know, right? Because it's all about context, right? Now, let me tell you how that's like so much deeper than just like the surface. So, you heard in the introduction, you know, I've been to, traveled to over 40 countries. And um, I've been, in, in, in Africa, I've probably been to like, 20 countries, been a lot of countries in Africa. And I'm, what's that? What countries? I mean, I've been West, South, North, East Africa, so a lot of countries. Where, where are you guys from? Ghana. I've been to Ghana. Yeah. Been to Accra, Kumasi, that's my, I love Ghana. So, okay, so in Africa, what's amazing to me is like Nigeria, for example. I was in Nigeria. I know there's some Nigerians here. There's no Nigerians in Okay, I knew there at least has to be one. Like, um, Nigerians roll deep. I'm surprised they're not more, but... Um, oh, you're Nigerian. Okay. He's about to give me that word, too. He's like, I'm right here. So, <laughs> so, all right. So, one of the things that's fascinating about your country, I love Nigeria. I was actually recently in Abuja. One of the things that's amazing about Nigeria is, in Nigeria, there are over 400 languages spoken. So you think that's one country in West Africa, right? And they speak so many languages, so many dialects in one place. A lot of times when we think about America and African Americans, we see ourselves as like one, like we came from Africa. But we don't really make the distinction that like we are all these different ethnic groups. Like, you know, like for example, I did my family lineage and I found that I'm Yoruba. Do you know what you are? Yeah. And Nigeria, oh, yeah. ethnic group, which one? Epic. So he's epic, I'm Yoruba, you might be Evo, you might be Hausa, you might be Uthalani, you might be Ashante, you might be, like, there's all these different ethnic groups, all these different languages in Africa, right? So we came to America, we didn't all speak the same language. We were all African, but we didn't all speak the same language, we didn't all have the same background, right? And so we get to America, and we all have to learn English. That's the, that's the commonality, right? The common language that kind of unite. We all have to learn the same language. Um, and we don't necessarily speak each other's home languages, right? And so English becomes this common language that we all learn. But there's a fundamental problem. The same people that are teaching you the language are the same ones that got you in the chains, right? So the oppressor is teaching you language. And he's teaching you language so that he can what? Tell you what to do. You know what I'm saying? He's not teaching you emancipatory language. He's telling you, teaching you language that's gonna keep you right where you are, right? And so here, as African people in America, we got this really interesting dilemma. How do we figure this out? How do we get free in the context of this language that's already oppressive, right? And so that's where, in Philly, we got this, you know, we say sometimes, we say, you gotta freak it, right? So we gotta freak the language, right? You gotta freak the language, you know what I'm saying? And I'll give you an example of freaking the language. Let's say back in the day, we're in this room like this, right? Let's say we're on a plantation or something, and 
you know, somebody comes and says, um, what's your name? Miss Weaver. Miss Weaver. Miss Weaver's like, did y'all, you know, now, so we're on the plantation, a bunch of African folk. Now there's some slave masters outside of here, okay? They're outside the room. And Miss Weaver's like, yo, did y'all hear MK escape the plantation? Cause you know, if I was on the plantation, I would, I would bounce. It's <laughs> like, yo, you hear MK escape the plantation? And, and y'all say, MK escaped the plantation? That's a bad nigga. <laughs> now, peep what's going on, right? The slave master hears that. He's like, yeah, that's right, that's a bad nigga, because he escaped. The <laughs> <laughs> slave master doesn't even understand what's going on right now. When y'all say, that's a bad nigga, y'all have freaked the language in, in, in two ways, right? Bad doesn't mean bad, and, and nigga don't mean nigger, right? You freak the language, right? And so when y'all say that's a bad nigga, y'all really saying like, yo, MK, that's, he's the truth. Like, that's that boy. Y'all, yo, you guys are celebrating me, right? And so that's freaking the language, right? And as soon as the slave master realizes one day, one day he's going to be like, hold on. When they say bad nigga, I think they write me something else. <laughs> and, and when he figures that out, we on to something else. We don't need to say that shit no more, right? Like, our language changes so quick. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I go, if I leave my neighborhood and come back one month later, they already got some new stuff they saying. Like, I can't even keep up, right? So language, so I used the, the, the John, I mean, that's just part of my experience growing up, but I wanted to just put that in like a larger context outside of just Philly, my book, hip hop. There's a deeper, you know, when you look at black language, there's a, a real deep, profound necessity for it, right? For why we speak the way we speak. Why we have to speak like, you know what I mean, with the John, you know what I mean, the John. There's a reason behind that, right? And, and the reason has to do with freedom, right? And being able to take a language and use it to get free when it's not been given to you for that purpose. And so I think it's beautiful what we've done with, with language. Um, but this book, you know, I wanted to introduce people to not only the language of where I'm from, but the people in my life who influenced me greatly. So I introduce you to my brother, Uwa Uzi. Um, as you guys know, Uzi was the color of walnuts had a face long and sharp, like the African mask, my pops hung up on the wall. And, um, you know, Uzi's my hero, you know, and I put, Uzi's a big part of the book, and I, what, I, what I wanted to do is show perspective. So I put Uzi's prison letters in the book. I put my mom's diary entries in the book, you know what I mean? Just to kind of show where everybody was, and not just from my perspective, you know, but also from like, how they would write about it and, and what, they, what they said about it, you know, and how they felt at the time, you know. Um, and my mom, you guys read her, her letters? I asked my mom, like, you know, because it was my mom's idea to put, she, well, she offered, she said, um, she said, you know, I know you're writing this memoir, she said, you know, if you want to use my journal entries that you used to read, <laughs> um, my diary entries you used to read, <laughs> I used to be so nosy, <laughs> I probably still am, <laughs> but I used to like just, I would just go through my mom, I would just go through everything, like all the drawers, I would just look, did you guys ever do that? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't me, it wasn't only me, I'm like other people had to do this, um, but my mom was like, you can use it if you want. And I was like, why would you want me to use this? Like, this is like the most personal stuff ever. Like, it's embarrassing, some of it. Like, why would you? And she was like, look, black people don't talk about mental health issues. Like, we don't talk about it. Like, so she's like, hopefully my story can inspire people to like, make it not so much of a stigma. You know what I mean? Take the stigma away from it. Cause we don't talk about it. And it's so true. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why her, her entries are in there, to kind of open up that dialogue. I remember when I first learned about mental health issues, I was actually in college, even though my mom suffered from this all through high school. It wasn't until college where I really like started doing research and like reading about it and like articles and like, okay, this is interesting, you know, um, reading about it from a psychological perspective. And then I had an epiphany. I was like, damn, 
everybody I grew up with has a mental health issue. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Like, like, it's classified, like, you know what I mean? Like, we used to call, you know, Scoop, or we used to call uh, T-Rux, we used to, oh, you know, they crazy. <laughs> but like, they really had some serious <laughs> issues that were not addressed. And if those issues go unaddressed, then of course they're gonna be acting like, we didn't see it as, this person has a mental health issue. We saw this, yo, he just be wild. Like, he just be what? But no, that's not wild. That's mental health. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so it, it was fascinating to learn about those things. Um, Buck is also about, obviously, my, you know, discovery of literature. You know, um, whenever I meet, yeah, like, yeah, I've been in DC for the last couple of days uh, working with high school students, and um, whenever I meet young people who, you know, don't like to read, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, because a lot of them tell me like, yo, I hate reading, but until I read Buck, now I love, I love reading and they want more books. And I think that's the case with like a lot of people who don't like reading. It's like, when I was young, I didn't like reading um, until I read some shit that was hot and then I wanted to read, you know what I mean? And that's really like how it works. Like you keep giving people whack books and then wondering why they're not reading. It's because you're the books you're giving them. You have to give better books. And as writers, we have to write for our people. Like when I wrote Buck, like I wrote it with you guys in mind. I wrote it for the kids in DC in mind and be more like I wrote it with that in mind. You know what I mean? Um, that was important to me, um, to write literature for us. One of the epiphanies that I have in the book, obviously, is when I discover that, uh, you know, why reading was illegal during slavery. You know, that epiphany that I had. Like, oh, now I see why reading was illegal during slavery, right? Because I always heard that coming up. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. You know, reading used to be illegal. They never really go into it, but they always just tell you back in the day, it was illegal. And I remember going to prisons, going to see my brother in jail, you know, um, getting locked up myself when I was a teenager, and really, like, looking at a jail and thinking about that. Like, dang. You could really get locked up for this back in the day. What's your name? Rashawn. Rashawn. He's from Philly. He's from Southwest. Um, me and Rashawn could be in the prison in Southwest or somewhere in Philly or somewhere in the country back in the day. He's in there. He's like, yo, what you in here for, MK? I'm like, yo, dog. I was on like chapter five, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, they just busted in with the, you know what I mean, with the guns. He's like, damn, man, you got a book for a book? Yeah, man, I'm here for a book. Um, you know, back in the days, riding in the car, you gotta hide the books, riding dirty, you know what I'm saying? Book clubs, you need to look out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it was so much, you know? People hiding books everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Putting books in the butt cracks. <laughs> to hide them from the police. <laughs> People did this. And then they had to read those books at some point after that. You know? So this is what really happened. And so I used to wonder like about that until I actually saw these things. And then I was like, wow, what what's the power of reading? Why, why is this why was this illegal? And um, I started learning about subvocalization, which is just the idea that we think in words. So the more words you know, the more things you can think about. You know what I mean? Um, so when you limit someone's words or vocabulary, you're not just limiting them. <clears throat> you're limiting their thoughts. They can't even conceive of freedom because they don't have the, they don't have it, right? They don't have the language to access those ideas. So they can't even conceive it in a sophisticated way, right? So reading to me became connected to like liberation and freedom. And the blank page became very important. That's why I say blank page saved me. America enraged me. Then that trick paid me. New slaves, old slavery. My grandma told me the streets far from holy. Now I'm lonely. My homies' bodies is holy. Um, so that's the blank page. You know what I'm saying? That's why I talk about the blank page as kind of being salvation for me. Because that's where I could use that language that, that I was learning. It's where I could try to design my own reality. And by designing my own reality, this is what I mean. To me, that's the purpose of you being in school, you know? Um, 
I heard the dean say something earlier uh, that kind of stuck with me, which was about kind of like taking, like having different fields and, you know, if one doesn't work, you can park yourself somewhere else. And, uh, you know, I would just add to that and maybe slightly revise it and just say, you know, education for me is about um, taking all those different disciplines and fields and things you're learning and applying them to whatever you do. So, for example, for me, as a filmmaker, my background as a hip hop artist, or my background as a professor, or my background as a writer helps me in film. As a professor, my background in hip hop helps me be a professor. And as a, you know, all of these things, they're not like one or the other, or, you know, they're all coexisting together, you know what I mean? Um, and I think they allow you to, um, to go very fast, you know? Um, I've never been. I've always wanted to, to move. I've always been about movement and going, you know what I mean? That's been a big part of, of, of my journey. Um, you know, I have a, a, I have a song called Wonderlust, uh, Wonderlust, which is just about traveling and the need to go. I write about that in, in my book as well. Um, so that's been a big part of my journey, it's just going. And I feel like education either is gonna prepare you for maintaining status quo or transforming it. And don't let school get in the way of your education. Mark Twain said that, right? School and education, as I talk about in the book, can be as close or as distant as sex and love. Like, just because you go to school doesn't mean you get educated. Education is something that you have to be a part of. You have to take initiative, you gotta bring it to the table, you have to want it. Just having, like, just to be real with you, you know, because I, I always just keep it real, I mean, just having a degree at this day and age that's not where it's at. You actually have to be educated. You have to, it's not about the piece of paper or the degree or where you went, to, none of that matters. It's about you. Are you educated? Do you have new ideas? And when I talk about education, I'm talking about new ideas. We need new ideas. We need new thoughts, innovators, new language, create new language. You know what I mean? Like, that's how we get to new ideas. Right? We don't even have a new idea. You need the language. So, but we need innovate. We don't need people just following every, you know. We need thinkers. We need you to be critical thinkers and analytical and think for yourselves and create jobs. <coughs> don't, you don't always have to look for a job, but you can create your own jobs as well, you know. Um, so I think that's like the spirit of Buck, you know. Um, the spirit of Buck, I talk about Buck now. I said I was going to come back to that. That's basically just like, when you think about, there's a scene where I'm in, in jail, um, in Buck, and all the elephants, right? Um, you guys remember that? Or do you want me to read it? Read it. I read it. <laughs> um, so, I'm in the 35th precinct. What age? I'm on page. <laughs> I'm on page two. Two thirteen. Two twelve to two thirteen. So, so I'm in. I'm in. I'm locked up in the thirty fifth precinct. And here's the thing. Decisions lead to options, options to choices, choices to freedom. We all design our own reality, write our own script, build our own house or prison or coffin. Me against law and order is about being a true rebel, pushing against the grain, making my own path, bucking the system. I think about this show I saw on the Nature Channel the other day about elephants, about how despite weighing up to 25,000 pounds and standing 13 feet tall, they can still be chained. How, I wonder, it starts when they're babies. Some asshole puts a metal chain attached to a wooden peg nailed into the ground around a baby elephant's foot. The baby elephant struggles but fails to break free and learns at that very moment never to struggle. That struggle is useless. Later on, even when the elephant can easily break free, it doesn't. I look around the jail, the 35th precinct, at all of these sad, hard, young, gray, black faces and see nothing but <coughs> elephants. So for me, like bucking the system or, or what buck is really about is like bucking that, right? It's bucking that like conditioning, right? 
even my conditioning has been conditioned, right? But bucking that condition, right? Bucking the stereotypes, the traps, all of that. Um, you know, part of it is, I, I wrote a piece called Two Sets of Notes that I want to spit for you. Um, I wrote this when I was in college, actually. And um, it deals with how, as black students, we have to take two sets of notes. Not just in school, but in life. Two sets of notes. Don't just believe what you're fed or what you, what older people tell you, whatever. So here it goes. I find myself feeling as if I'm touching the ground and the ceiling. In schools that don't engage in healing, nah. They simply open the wounds and entrap me in rooms where I am consumed by hypocrisy. But hold up, hold up. Even Greek philosophers weren't the authors of their own philosophies. Man, and the statues on campus be watching me. Washington, Jefferson, Williams, clocking me. As if to say, my time's up. But I don't run laps on track. See, I run laps around the scholars of tomorrow because their new schools of thought are merely our histories borrowed. And they label me militant and black national radical. Yo, they tried to put my learning process on sabbatical. But I don't apologize. I put truth into those eyes that have been infected by those lies. Mm -hmm. Then they try to get me to see their point of view from a cat that looked like me. Mm -hmm. But he don't walk like me, talk like me, or act like me. And homie started running when I asked if he was black like me. Mm -hmm. Mastering their thoughts and forgetting our own, and you wonder why we always feel alone. From the media to academia, hanging brothers like coats. Mm -hmm. That's why in their schools, you've got to take two sets of notes. Mm -hmm. One set to ace the test, and the other set I call the truth. And when I find historical contradictions, I use that first set as proof, proof that black youth's minds are being polluted and convoluted and diluted and not culturally rooted in anything except the Western massacre. That's why most of us in school, shit, we were scared of Africa. We viewed our mother's land through the eyes of racists like David Hume and Emmanuel Kant, not knowing Emmanuel Kant tell me shit about a land he's never seen, a land rich with history, beautiful kings and queens but they had us believe otherwise. The history they taught was built on high-rise lies. They didn't teach me that the pyramids were completed before Greece and Rome were conceptualized. Mm -hmm. Then they tried to claim the Egyptians' race was a mystery. And I used to believe them until I read Herodotus and went to Egypt and saw book two of the histories. Can it be any clearer? Black students, look in the mirror. We are a reflection of divinity. Don't let them fool you with selective memory. Walk high, listen to the elders who spoke. Black students, all students, always take two sets of notes. So that's two sets of notes. <laughs> On the road to success, many obstacles. I remember when they said it wasn't logical, when they was like, it's really just improbable. And then they told me my dream's impossible. But now it seems the ball unstoppable. Number one, do the math on top of bull. We're just warming up. We still got a lot to do. Look in the mirror, like really, who's stopping you? Nobody, from the lobby to the rooftop. Now we influential, no flu shot. Newton's law of motion it means we don't stop. Acceleration, celebration, we made it. I still remember North Philly, them dirty basements. Pavements, blank pages where the pain went. To pavements backstage, we world changing. We lived the dream, say grace, y'all. Amazing. MK from the city of the Fresh Prince, where they carried them Wessons and Will Smith. This is real ish, gotta deal with. Trite broken bodies on the street lights. Middle of the night, we still can't get right. Cause we got vision, but we lost sight. Like how I had a best friend, but he lost life. Senseless, cause niggas was scentless. Self-destruction, looking seductive. Half the parts, but no instructions. So we look in the parts, but lack substance. When my raps tap hearts like your favorite cousin. And BuzzFeed even said my buzz was buzzing. Did what the pundit said I wasn't. Repudiated the repugnant, like Douglas. Yeah, and I write for young bucks in the ghetto. Illustrating life on a higher level. Teach them how not to settle through the treble. Problem with authority, I always been a rebel. Rose from concrete, always been a pedal. Saying fuck, fear, and doubt, always been the devil. Runaway slave, running from the grave, man. Ran from being saved. Can I get an A, man? Say, man, I was wondering why you running. Hey, fam, I ain't running. I'm chasing something. Uptown Philly, where they be clapping a lot. Killers on they dean get at you, they make us a lot. Cops like Kim Elijah, why they shaking the block? We play with fire, cause it's better to burn in the rock. I've been running my whole life. 
Soul like my skin, the color of midnight. So when I hold the pen, my brothers, they kind of life. I be up writing for little Tamir Rice. Real Adelphia raised me crazy. Rocks in the system, 80s baby. <laughs> Mama knocked on wisdom, praise the lady. <laughs> Shout out Zimbabwe, land that raised me. Yo. <laughs> What's up, y'all? How y'all doing? <laughs> I'm just messing around, having fun with y'all. So, um, you know, what I want to do at this time, I'm really curious to hear from you guys. I want to hear your thoughts, questions, comments. You can ask me about the book. You can ask me about something else. Um, whatever you guys want. But I want to just kind of open it up now. Yep. I have a question for you. All right. I've been listening to you for the greatest trust. And constantly I'm wondering, what is it that you're trying to <laughs> you know, um, I told you, you know, in my in my presentation. Well, first of all, first of all, you know, um, I think when we talk about sub vocalization, you know, what I was talking about is just words and language. It's always been connected to emancipation and liberation for me. Um, so I think fast, talk fast, you know, but I can slow it down too. You gotta put on a slow beat, you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 uh huh. So, what is the old one or were you just developing as you were talking? Uh, it was a combination of both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you nervous about putting your story out? Um, and like. Introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kavanya Jones. Um, I'm a sophomore here. My question is, were you nervous about putting your story out? Um, and like, how have you been feeling since since you released it? Do you care about others' opinions? Cool. That's a good question. Um, well, when I was first writing the book, I was definitely nervous uh, at a certain point. Um, I remember when I first got the book deal, I was happy. And then, okay, I got a question for you guys. So, how many writers in here? Oh, that's a, that's a lot. Okay, good. So, I have a question for you. So, this is a question for the writers. Question for the writers. Do you writers have an idea in your head, right? That when you think about the idea, it makes you like nervous or scared, or you think to yourself like, I can never do that. You might think about it, but you're like, no, nah, I can't do that. Shit. Right. Okay, so that's how Buck was for me. Like, I would have random thoughts about, oh, I could write a movie, but then it would be like, that's crazy. Like, so then when I actually got the book deal for Buck, first I was happy, then I was like, damn, I gotta write it. <laughs> and then it changed it, like, cause then you're like, damn, I, it was, sounded good when it was a concept, you know what I'm saying? But now I just gotta do this shit. <laughs> and, and, and it's very emotional. I gotta deal with all these. So, at first I was stuck and I had no confidence. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just give the money back, the advance back. I don't wanna do this. I'm good. Like, I, I don't need, to, like, I just can't. I, and I can't do it. Not only do I not want to do it, I can't do it. I don't have this, the skills to do it. That's why. That's why I was thinking. So I told you, my Angelo. Well, you heard my Angelo gave me a quote for the book. Um, my Angelo was a mentor of mine. So around that time, I was speaking at Wake Forest University, right? So I was on my way to Wake Forest, and I get a a call from my Angelo's assistant, and she's like, "We saw that you're going to be in Winston Salem. Uh, Dr. Angelo wants you to come by the house." I'm like, "Cool." You know what I'm saying? I'm be coming by the house. <laughs> so I get to Dr. Angelo's house, Auntie Maya's crib um, in Winston-Salem. And for, like for the first 30 minutes, we were just talking just about random stuff. And then as I was sitting there listening to her talk, I thought to myself, I should ask her what I should do about the memoir. Because I'm having a difficult, I'm having a real difficult time at this point. Like, I don't want to do it type time, right? So. I'm like, Auntie Maya, um, I got this book deal. You know, it's kind of a big deal. I'm not really thinking I could do it. What do you, what's your advice to me? 
She told me a lot of other good things that day too. Funny thing. She was real funny. She's a cool person. But anyway, so back to the story. <laughs> I go off on a lot of so back to the story. So I say, Dr. Angelo, I'm struggling with this book, like, give me some, you know, advice. And she said, just tell the truth. She said, you know, just tell the truth. She said, you don't have to tell the brutal truth, because the truth is brutal enough. He said, just tell the truth. He said, don't get caught up on, like, what street, what house number, like, this was in 1997. Like, she said, don't get caught up on, like, those things. She said, you can figure out those things later. She said, the main thing is, how did you feel? What was going on? You know, write the truth. She said, when you write the truth, it's going to connect with people who don't look like you, people who look like you, because the truth is universal. You know, we all go through, if you write the truth, so we're talking about like, so let's strip away Philly. Let's strip away, you know, um, hip hop, Afrocentricity. Strip away all of these different things, right? That kind of culturally make us who we are. And now we're just talking about loneliness, isolation, depression, prison, mental health, incarceration, abandonment, um, you know, domestic dispute. Like, those are universal. You could be in Iowa or India or wherever, and you have those same issues of not feeling like school is connecting to you, not feeling like you're learning it, not feeling like you belong here, not feeling like, you know, all these different things. So, once she told me that, I remember that, that night, I was like, I knew that I would be able to write the book. And then, what happened after that, I think that the only other big phase for me was, um, really, I always was the kind of person that didn't really care that much what people thought, um, but still like a little bit. And then like, but in order to write this book, I had to absolutely not care, like no fucks given. Like, that was the only way it was going to happen. Like, seriously, if you want to write a memoir and you really, and you give a fuck, don't write a memoir. Seriously, that's my advice to you. Don't do it. You're wasting everybody's time. You have to get to that point because you're not trying, you're, if you're writing a memoir, you're telling your story. It's not a vehicle to please this person, to please this person and make you, you're telling your story. And folk might not like the way it comes out sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like, but that's your story. And that's how you, and so, in order to really do that effectively, you can't be worried about what everyone thinks about it because there's too many people to, you'll, you'll, write, you'll end up writing something that's whitewashed, right? That's stripped of all the, the energy, stripped of all the juice, stripped of all the nutrients, stripped of everything good. And then what you, you end up with a book that, yeah, maybe the people around you, I, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hit, right? It doesn't, people, and people can sense inauthenticity when something's not, you're not being honest, you're not being open. So the whole point of a memoir for me is like to put it out there and to write it in a way that's organic to who I am. So once I got over that last little part of Karen, <laughs> then I was good. I think, um... Some of the things that helped me get over that was just realization that like, when you write a memoir, it's not like you're trying to, it's not like I was trying to hurt anyone's feelings or anything like that, but you have to tell your story. You know what I mean? And you, you have to do it unapologetically, you know? And um, I think, yeah, I think those are, the, those are kind of some of the things that, that helped me do that. Yeah. Stand up, Um, that's an interesting question. Um, well, when I was very young, I saw a lot of good examples. I mean, when I was young, I saw a lot of great examples um, of people. You know, I was fortunate to see a lot of positive examples. Um, when I got to be around the buck age, uh, those positive influences started to kind of wane out, um, and I started to be around not positive influences, um, like the corner boys and just everybody in UPK, just that whole scenario. Um, so during that time, I wasn't even, I, I wasn't writing, I wasn't in school, I wasn't very focused. Um, even before I wrote Buck, like one of the struggles I was having, it's interesting, so Buck 
Now, in the bio, it's a little bit wrong. It's actually been on the bestsellers now for three years, um, not two. Which is interesting because when I wrote it, one of the, I say in one of my rhymes that uh, fuck, fear, and doubt always been the devil. The reason why I say that is because I remember when I was writing the book, one of the thoughts I was having was, yo, this was in my head. My voice in my head is like, yo, Mala, who's gonna read this book? Like, nobody's gonna read this shit. Like, that's what my voice kept telling me, like, you're too young to write a memoir. Like, nobody's interested in your story, dog. Like, just drop, give it up, dog. Like, you know, the, like your voice, the, the, your, that's the biggest obstacle to greatness is yourself. That's why I said in the song, other song, you know, look in the mirror, like, really, who's stopping you? Like, it's you. It's you, like, it's your, all those voices being, telling you all the reasons why you're not gonna do it and why, you know, you can't do it and you don't have this and you don't have that and you're not, all of that is the devil. Fear and doubt, right? That's the devil. And so, you know, um, you know, we gotta eliminate that devil, you know, the, 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 those noises, right? Um, fallen angel. Balance dangled. I came here on a black star that was spangled. I landed in Philly city of angles. Everybody got my hot ones to the cops come. I am from where you were not from. Nizar, you cannot come. Wait in the car. Every day the earth quake my faith in the law. But my power keep growing like 48 laws. Down so long, might never get up. Out the mud so raw, I don't never get stuck. Heavenly stuff, the reverend erupt. How much is enough? Depending on what you got in the trunk. Depending on these devils cause they got what I want And hell of in advance so I can get it in front So I can get it up front, props for the prop Stopping you up, hop the cop, pop a top in the blunt This that tabletop, lunch room, free lunch room hip hop That labelless melanin hitting your eardrop The devil disappeared when your fear stopped So fear not my have nots and earshot that's all I wanted to say, actually. I just had to do all the other stuff to get to the last part, but that's what I wanted to say. Some, sometimes, sometimes I can't remember like a line. I have to go through the whole thing. But what I wanted to say was, the devil disappeared when your fear stopped. So fear not, my have not, and so ear shot. Yeah. How you doing? What's up, bro? My name is Steven Nesbitt. I'm a freshman here at Virginia a business major. Nice. Um, it's not really a question. It's something I just want to express with you. Um, as a black man in this society, we feel like we're nothing. Like we can't accomplish nothing. There's people who leave as kids and things like that. Um, when I read the book, book, I related a lot to the book. Literally, like everything you went through, I went through the exact same thing. I have a couple of books under my you know, belt, but I'm not a big reader or anything like that. But I always wanted to be something like, you know, like I wanted to change the world somehow, especially right. the black community wise. Right. And during time, you know, really wasn't going to come to college, but during time I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm not Bill Gates. I don't have the money or anything like that. But reading your book, I established hope again to actually try to, you know, yeah. change the community. Right. And I just want to thank you for yeah. giving me that inspiration. Thank you. I think, I think that I appreciate that, bro. And, um, you know, that's, that's the beauty of when you tell your story. I mean, one of the things that I, one of the things that inspired me when I was writing this book is this is what I said to myself. I said, yo, yo, Milo. When I talk to myself, I call myself Milo. Yo, Milo. <laughs> By the way, he said, uh, the dean was asking about my real name or like my full name. Um, and my middle name, even though in the book, I, act, I never, dis, I never, I do say it in the book what my middle name is, but you don't know how to pronounce it because it's written. But my actual middle name is Milo. Yeah, Milo. Yeah, you can call me for sure. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, but what I wanted to say is real quick is when you tell your, <laughs> <what's up? laughs> be like, um, but when you tell your story, when you tell your story, specifically your story. The crazy part is, and this is what you know, the, the archetypes that Maya Angelou was talking about, when you specifically tell your story, 
you're actually telling everyone's story in a way. There's so many people who they're gonna be like, yo, this is my life right now. Like, in fact, on the, in the, on the way up here, um, we were listening to a song, you know? Um, Renato, the photographer, he listened to a song and he said, man, this is my life right now, you know? And, but that song was that artist's life, you know? But it's all of, we're all experiencing a lot of the same things, you know? And so when you can tap into that truthfully and honestly for yourself, you're also tapping into it for other people. And you're liberating them in a sense, right? And you're giving them courage to tell their story. Like, you might see me up here, see me rapping and see me talking and uh, like, oh, I, I can tell my story. I have a story, you know, and it's, it's supposed to do that. You know what I mean? Like, there should be a bunch of memoirs written by young African-Americans, you know what I mean? That we can choose from. Yes. Yes, my name is Sir James Luber. I'm a senior here, I'm a political science major. And the one thing that I noticed about your, your rap is that it's, 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 it's innovative as far as uh, the topics that you cover. And I noticed that within the rap culture now, we have a lot of rappers that portray lifestyles that they don't come from. They're not perpetuating any type of growth. And I think that more kind of rap, like the rap that you have, means come to fruition. Um, and also, I'm not sure if you're a fan of KRS-One, but it appears as though you may have some, you may be influenced by him in, in some way or form. Fashion. And I think that uh, you should continue with that. And my question to you is, is, do you think it's possible for a different type of rap to evolve, like rap discussing politics, rap discussing, you know, different types of ideas instead of selling drugs and shooting and things like that? I think that we need to uh, proliferate our knowledge and, and one way we can do that is to change it, to evolve a change and catalyze a change in our culture, rap culture. Word, word. Good Live from the flames of Baltimore. What you call this? You don't call it war. Tanks in my hood, no aquarium. No thanks in that guard, ain't scared of them. Buzz cuts and Humvees hunt me bluntly, cause I be the color of blunt leaves. Leaving streets redder than monthlies. Black light, we on that month to month lease. So we burn this. Wake up, shoot a scene like I'm earning. <laughs> My jaw caked up, she done earned it. <clears throat> Stakes up, memoirs of an earnest kid. Unforgettable, super unfuckwittable. MK insurance, acclaimed critical. No assurance, even with insane visuals. We hype when they indict. Slave residuals. Ha! Huh. And I get paid in miracles. Don't get played cause they aim subliminal. Behind bars, super max and minimals. Jump on a Knox raw track, wax spiritual. Measure my net worth in megahertz. So much death on my turf, I got megahertz. Mm -hmm. And I'm so used to pain, I think I'm better hurt. Kurt Cobain, man, with death I flirt. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Learn how to play ball with a hanger. They used to cut your balls off when they hang ya. Balls like these so ready and danger. Bulletproof the range, rarely in danger. Out your range, dog, Mesopotamia. With my young bucks, rearranging our anger. VUU on the system, we bang ya. <laughs> but, um, okay, so to answer the brother's question, the reason why I answered the question like that is because one of the most powerful quotes I ever came across said, the most powerful form of critique is creation. So when you want to hear my critique of rap, just listen to my shit. You know what I mean? That's my critique. Like, that, because you're creating an alternative. Like, that's so, you're being critical in the creation of your own work, right? And so, for me, my critique of, like, hip-hop, a lot of times, is just in the music I make. Like, that's my critique of it, right? So the most powerful form of critique is creation. That's, that's something that inspired me to be an MC. Um, but beyond that, I want to say that any MC today is influenced by KRS-One, whether they know it or not, you know what I'm saying, conscious of it or not, um, you know, they, they have to be. Even, like, even for example, like, you know, KRS-One just came out with another diss song to MC Shan, like 30 years later. Um, but even like just the beef, uh, so many, KRS-One, we know him as being conscious, but he was the first, that was the first person I ever seen with a Glock. You know what I mean? On the cover of the jaw, like, so, uh, but this is what I want to say about hip hop. We are in the resurrection of hip hop right now. 
I hope you feel it. I hope you see it. But there's a resurrection of hip hop. When he asked about will hip hop evolve into, no, no, no. Hip hop was that. We devolved, right, into something else. And now we are finding ourselves again. Um, but I think hip hop is still the most powerful, like, cultural force on the planet. Um, in all those 40 countries that I've been to, hip hop has been a major part of youth culture there. You know what I mean? I've never been to a place where hip hop has not been a part of the youth culture, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in South America, Asia, Europe, all over the world. So hip hop is this huge, important thing. And I think what's happening now is young people, the new generation is, first of all, there's a lot of artists out there that are making the kind of music that you're talking about. And not only are there, there's always been artists that have been doing it. The only difference is now, those artists are the artists that are selling the most. Who sold the most last year? J. Cole. Who sold the most last year? Kendrick Lamar. Logic. These are people that are not rapping about the trap. They're not rapping. They are pushing the boundaries of hip hop and you guys are voting with your dollars and saying that that's what you want to hear. J. Cole had no features on his album. You know what I mean? No radio play, really. But it, it, went, it, was the, it went platinum, right? Because there's a need for that honesty. There's a need for people talking about social issues. And so I think that kind of hip hop is actually back. I think it's stronger than ever. Those are two MCs, but I could name 30 MCs, you know, um, that are part of this resurrection of hip hop. Um, and yeah, I think it's back. I think not only do we see it back in the music, we see it back in the styles, like the actual styles that people, things that people are wearing are kind of back to the 90s, you know, that whole era, everything is coming back. You know what I mean? Even like the whole, like even with Black Lives Matter and just everything in terms of, and I think that's actually a part of it. The reason why you need, think about it. You had a Black Lives Matter rally, like, you know, no disrespect to future, but you can't be like, wee, 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 wee. that's not really gonna get you, that's not gonna get the law passed, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, that's not going to rally your people up. You know, because all this music is connected to, you know, back in the day, when I talk about John and slavery, and so all these music, this is coming from, this is our essence and who we are. We use these songs to get through the plantation. We use these songs to run away. We use these songs to fight Jim Crow. We use these songs to fight segregation. We use these songs to fight. We've been using this music and this energy for a long time. And so when you have something like Black Lives Matter and a whole new generation of young people who are conscious, who want to be conscious, what's the soundtrack for that? What's the soundtrack to the conscious movement, right? I mean, what are you, what, what are you going to, you go so you march for Black Lives Matter, then you get in the car, then what do you listen to? So that's why there's a necessity, there's a need for, we going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? And it has a completely different vibration than, you know, a, another song that might just be, you know, talking about, um, I got bras in Atlanta, you know what I'm saying? That's a totally different, like, it's cool that you got bras in Atlanta, but, we're trying to get free right now in this moment in time. You know what I'm saying? So, um, how about you get your bras from Atlanta and we can, we can all march for freedom, you know what I'm saying? And get this shit um, but yeah, so I think that this is needed. I think there is a resurrection in hip hop. I'm thrilled to be a part of the resurrection of hip hop. I'm thrilled to witness it, to be a part of it, to see it. Um, and you guys should see it and be a part of it. So then I thought to myself, man, if I told my story, how I got here, that would probably inspire a lot of young people who might be going through similar things or might, it's not about where you are right now, right? It's about where you wanna go, where you can go, your potential, right? It's not about your past, it's about what you wanna do and if you like, that you don't have to be defined or reduced to your past or to what other people around you are doing. So I felt like if I wrote my story, it'd be inspirational. I also realized, what also inspired me is, um, I just realized that I had a story to tell. Like at first, I didn't realize I had a story. And a lot of you might feel the same way right now. Like, oh, I don't have a story. Because you're so used to your story. It's not a story, it's your, it's your life. Like, I didn't see my story as a, it was my life, like, this is just my life, like, yeah, like, and I thought that everything 
that I experienced was what everybody experienced. Just like you probably think the things that you've been through, most people, you know, maybe you don't, maybe you're realizing now in college that you have different backgrounds from people, you know, and sometimes completely different backgrounds. And that's what I started to realize was that my unique, my story growing up in Philly was like, I never met anybody that knew what I was taught. Like, they, people would look at me crazy when I would tell them, like, stuff from my past. They would be like, really? Like, I'm like, and I would look at them crazy, like, that didn't happen in your hood? And they're like, no, like, that's fucking crazy. And so, that kind of got me thinking, like, damn, well, maybe my story, maybe, like, my story is kind of unique. Like, maybe I should tell my story. So, that, but like I said, it was to, and also the, uh, th 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 third reason, most important reason, all my artistic things that I do is about this mantra that I have. If you make an observation, you have an obligation, right? Observation, obligation, that's my mantra, right? Um, and what that means is basically, there's a book that I want to read. I want to read it right now. There's only one problem, it doesn't exist. So I have to write it. There's a song that I would love to hear right now, it just doesn't exist. So I gotta go and collaborate and make that song. There's a movie that I wanna see, I think it would be dope as hell, yo, I think it would be like inspirational and da 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 But it doesn't exist, so you have to make it. And that's my message to you. If I could tell you anything, it's like, Fill those voids. All those things you see or want to see, the things that are missing, you got to fill that. So when you have that observation like, man, how come we don't have fill in the blank? Because you didn't make it yet. Or how come there's no fill in the blank? You know, you didn't do it yet. When I worked on the, me and Maya Angelou, uh, we wrote a film together called The Black Candle. And when I worked on that with her, I hit her up. I said, uh, actually she hit me up is how I went. I hit her up uh, on a letter and then she called back. But anyway, point is, when I talked to my Angelo, I said, um, look, I made an observation and this is the obligation. This is a film I want to make, it doesn't exist. And she said, then we have to make it. So she's on the same wave. Um, but yeah, that's the inspiration. Okay, one final question. Okay, I gotta go right here. She had her hand up, man. Hi, my name is um, I'm a senior. My question is, how did your past shape you into the man that you are today? Um, I mean, it, I think just, and I think that question, like for all of us, is kind of the same. Like we all are products of our experience, right? I mean, to some extent, and other things too, but we're all products of our experience. So I think, you know, I think actually, I'll tell you something interesting. So I'm in academia, kinda, um, <laughs> professor, um, and I've been tenured, I've been a tenured professor for like, I don't know, a long time. <laughs> I'm not even gonna remember. Maybe eight years, something like that, nine years, something like that. But um, having like street smarts, like things I learned on the street, I apply them in academia. I'm gangster. <laughs> yeah. And that actually, like, so you talk about how the past could help. There's, th there's situations in corporate America and active, even with my pub with Random House. I, sometimes I have to get very Philly on them. And it's very helpful to be able to get in my bag real quick. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can get in my bag real quick and just get things done. That's all it's about. Let's expedite this process a little bit. I'm gonna have to get on my door real quick and, 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 and you know, and just use another skill set that I have. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we could do this like this way or I could get into some, you know, some more, you know what I mean? Some other things I learned back in the day. But no, I'm serious though. I mean, that's why you see people like Jay-Z being successful in corporate situations, right? It's like, it's not just, you can't learn that at, at school. Part of that is, Street, street intelligence. There's, you know, Buck is about miseducation. It's about re-education. It's about self-education. It's about street education. It's about the difference between school and education. But you ask me how past influences the present, or you know, and that's something that I, that, that that struck me. 
because some people would discount the street and say, well, you can't learn anything on the streets except how to go to jail, which um, on some level, the streets, you know, obviously there is that path, right? But if you can extract certain things from that, right, that won't get you in trouble, that won't take, and apply those to a corporate situation or academic situation, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's I think it can be very effective, and I'm an example of that because um, there's definitely times where I've had to get you know what I mean, <laughs> you know, and it, hey, you know, everybody, it's just it just it's just another tool that you have, you know what I mean, and if you have those tools, so that's how my past has affected, um, you know, growing up in Philly, I talk about in that song I say you know. Philly, everybody got an angle. You know, I talk about it in the book. Um, I feel like growing up in Philly, growing up in some of the environments I grew up in, have like a really good like bullshit detector. So like when people like BS you, like you know like so quickly, like whereas it might take someone else like mad long to realize that this person is full of it. You know what I'm saying? Where like I didn't even have a conversation with yo because I knew like what it was. And so, again, I just see like um, certain times where, you know, street smarts, you know, and I see some people in academia with no street smarts, like zero, like you can have as many degrees, but they don't have basic common, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of, um, so, you know, it's, it's a real interesting thing about education, being a professor, traveling to lots of schools, being also someone who still goes to Philly, still hangs out with Baltimore, still sees like people who don't have formal education and spends a lot of time with those people as well, um, it makes me it takes me back to that idea of education is something that you have to pursue, and regardless if you're in school or not. Like there's professors that I work with that you know um, don't are not educated, and then there's people on the street right outside of where I work at who are educated but have never been inside of the school. You know what I mean? And so, you know, um, you have to take your education in your own hands, mold it, shape it, make it work for you. Like this, you're here to learn the language and tools so that you can design your own reality, whatever that is for you. That's what you guys should be like working on, designing your reality. What is the life that you want? What is success for you? Defining that for yourself and then using all the tools and skills and language you get here to design it and build it. So um, I think that's how it helped me. Just, you know, I think the street smarts is helpful in all situations. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I just started reading this book right here, um, and I, come, I was born. I was born in '89. I'm a transfer student, I'm 27 years of age. I, I definitely I know about that enriched hip hop culture from the '90s uh, with Tupac Shakur, Biggie Smalls, and even before Mo, that, uh, 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 Mo, um, um, what's his name, um, Pablo Tali, all them people. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say keep going, keep doing what you're doing. I wanna also mention to you that um, I actually do rap myself. Right. And I had started writing about a year ago. And I'm writing about my experiences. I come from I'm from originally from Providence, Rhode Island. I don't know if you've been to Providence. Um, but I come from a single parent home, I come from a low-income family, and I wanna talk about my experiences, but I wanna also I wanna talk about the things that can enlighten my demographic. That's why I mentioned about politics. I mean, those are the topics I want to discuss.